Welcome to A Walk in the Park with Animal Friends with me, Patricia, and Sky, as you can see here, who's just snuffling a treat there. And today we have got Jill from the Bumblebee Conservation Trust. Welcome, Jill. Good morning, and thank you so much for inviting me here. I'm very excited to talk to you. Oh, I'm so excited about I this love episode. love talking about bees. <laughs> and yeah. as you can see, or those who can't see, we've actually got knitted bees on our microphones, which is amazing. So thank you for, for bringing those along. So, Jill, tell us all about the uh, Bumblebee Conservation Trust and what you guys do. Yeah, well, it, it started in 2006. There were two really good scientists, Professor Dave Gawson, who a lot of people know. He's written a number of books, but the best one, I think, is A Sting in the Tail, because mm -hmm. it talks about founding the trust. And he had a PhD student called Ben Vandarville. Sorry, the dog <laughs> is moving the microphone. But we're the all studio. right. Well done, babe. She's good. <laughs> Uh, and he had a PhD student, Ben Darville, and the two of them did tons of research mm -hmm. uh, on bumblebees. And they suddenly realized that they were in steep decline. Okay. We'd lost two to extinction. We had two on the edge of extinction and six at risk. And we've only got 24 species of bumblebees in this country. Okay. So just on that point. Yeah. I had no clue that we had 24 species of bumblebee and they've got some of the most cool names. Can you just tell us, tell the listeners a few? Okay, so we've got, let's have a look, my favourite, the bilberry bumblebee. Yep. And if you want it in Latin, that's Bombus monticola. And some people call it the mountain bumblebee. Okay. So that's a beautiful bumblebee. Uh, we've got the buff-tailed bumblebee. Got Lovely. the white-tailed bumblebee. Common carder bee, the shrill carder bee. Now, a bit of an apocryphal story, but they think that the shrill carder bee is called the shrill carder bee because most of our bees go bzzz, but the shrill carder bee goes bzzz. Oh, nice. In a okay. shriller way. Yeah, so, so it does what it says on the tin. Totally. Love and it. And then another one of my favourites, the great yellow bumblebee, the mm. big, fluffy yellow ping pong ball of a bumblebee found in the north of Scotland. Yeah. Amazing creatures. Oh, uh, they are. Do you know what? We, we're very passionate about bees in our household. And, you know, I've seen bees that have been struggling. So I've helped either move them to flowers or if there are no flowers, put some sugar water down to Perfect. help them. Um, and my daughter has picked up on that. So she's 11. But a couple of years ago, she'd picked up on me rescuing this bumblebee. And um, at school, they found, unfortunately, a dead bumblebee. Mm. So she wasn't happy about that. Firstly, because she couldn't rescue it. But secondly, she then made all of her friends have a funeral <laughs> for this poor little How bumblebee. Wonderful. So they went and buried this bumblebee. But she understands the importance of bees. I love bees. But can you tell our listeners why a bee is so important to us? It's a funny question, that, because... I like to think that all creatures and bees have an intrinsic value of their own. Mm -hmm. They're not here primarily to support the human race, although without them, we would, we would all be dead. That's, you know, that's a truism. So if you think about the, all the food that we eat, 74% of crops that we grow in this country rely on an ecosystem service called pollination. Mm -hmm. Without pollination, nothing reproduces, nothing grows. Yep. So it's not just about the food that we eat, the fruit and vegetables. It's our dairy products. You know, the cows eat grass. And you might say, oh, Jill, cow, the wind-pollinated grass. But most pastures have got herbal lays in them and clover all need to be pollinated. And then you think of all the creatures like birds and voles and little dormice. They rely on the fruits mm. that, of pollination in the wild. The way our gardens look, all that colour, pollination. The way our countryside looks, yep. pollination. So they're absolutely vital for our food security, our human food security. Yep. But also the whole ecosystem, right? Totally. So it's not just, as you said, about humans and what we need to eat, but the whole ecosystem totally, relies on, supports on these it, amazing yeah. pollinators. And, and, you know, just to add to that, not many people know that we actually import around about 100,000 boxes of commercially farmed bumblebees into this country every year to support our soft fruit industry because we don't have enough bumblebees in this country to do it. 
So on that, why why do we not have enough bumblebees? What's happening to them? It was after the Second World War, we lost 97% of our wild flower meadows. Okay. Everything went down to food production, which was quite right at that point. We were all starving. You mm. know, there was, there was no food to be had. Um, and of course, bees need flowers. They need the nectar and pollen from flowers. So that was the start of the decline. We then had, uh, you know, we're a small island. We have a finite amount of land. Uh, we have a growing population. I'll say something quite uh, difficult now. We have a cheap food culture mm -hmm. and we have an intensive agricultural system. And that all of those lead to more declines. We also now, on top of that, overlying everything is climate change mm -hmm. and biodiversity loss. So there's a number of reasons. The main one is habitat loss, which is why our simple message at the Bumblebee Conservation Trust is grow more flowers. Okay. The more we grow, the better it's going to be for bumblebees. And anybody in their gardens can grow bumblebee-friendly flowers. So, you know, that's us, one of the simple messages that we've got. Fabulous. So how do I know what are the right plants uh, to attract and help bumblebees? So on our website, mm -hmm. we have uh, a free tool called Be Kind. Okay, and it lovely. Has, Love a yeah, bee pun. Great. And it has over 700 of the best bee-friendly flowers. And it also has super flowers marked with a little flower icon. Yep. Because some flowers have extremely good pollen and nectar content and quality, uh, particularly good at this time of year. Goat willow, you know, the pussy willow mm -hmm. with the golden pollen on the, the little furry pods. That's brilliant for bumblebees. That's a good early food. So is that really important now because they're starting to come out and there's not as much uh, food around for them? So yeah. uh, is it the queens that are coming out first and they need to be yeah. sustained? Yeah, they need to feed. As soon as they come out of hibernation, they're hungry. So they really need to get fed up uh, to, in order to be able to build a nest, mm -hmm. lay their eggs, have a colony and grow. Mm -hmm. So anything we can grow that's flowery at this time of year, spring bulbs, that sort of thing, pulmonaria, what else have we got going on at the moment? All oh, the primroses uh, coming out, oh, you know, go on, be kind. Mm -hmm. uh, you can sort by month, by shade, by sun, by soil type, by petal colour, by petal number. So you Love can it. sift the whole lot. Mm -hmm. So you've got something flowering throughout the bumblebee flight season. Yeah, I love that because I even just waking up from, you know, six to eight hours sleep I'm starving so yeah, let alone exactly. how long do they hibernate me for? too well it depends really it depends on the the weather yeah most of our bees will go into hibernation around September October time okay where I live down on the south coast we have a sort of mini microclimate mm -hmm. and we have what's called genetic risk takers oh I know exciting. I like the sound of that yeah. <laughs> and these are uh, queen bumblebees that will stay out all winter if there's enough food wow. they won't hibernate they won't build a colony because there won't be enough food, but they won't bother hibernating. And I have often seen uh, uh, bumblebees where I live on Mahonia mm. in, with a frost on it feeding. So, yeah. So they're but, just flying around doing the rain thing yeah. going, do you know what? I'm not going to sleep for the winter. Yeah. I'm just going to chill out. I don't have to look after anyone. It's Beautifully just me. Beautifully described. May I say I that? I love that. <laughs> and there are genetic risk takers. Okay. Well, I'm, <laughs> I'm loving the sound of those. I think if I'm reincarnated, I might be one of those. Mm. So you said that we've got, was it 24 different types of species, species yeah. in the UK? And um, what is the difference? And, and I, I think I want to bust some myths here around bumblebees and okay. honeybees and then actually the role that wasps play because, you know, one weekend I was stung seven times by wasps. They're Gosh, not my favourite. No. But I'm really hoping that they do have a role to play in the whole pollination they piece do. as well. They do. Well, let's start um, 400 million years ago. Oh, amazing. Right, I'm going to get comfy. So um, the bumblebees evolved in the Himalayas. Okay. And they actually evolved from wasps. No way. Yes, they did. So they did. do have a point. They do have a point. Good. And um, the bumblebees have got a big furry coat. Yep. Shall I show you a bumblebee? Oh, yes. Just on your bag or in your bag? <laughs> Oh, this is amazing. I love this. Isn't it? Obviously, absolutely. this is a super, super sight. Is this a buff tail? This is a white tail. A white tail. Bumblebee. Love it. Okay. So 
I can see it's got a really big, thick, furry coat yep. because it was used to flying in very cold conditions. Okay. And even now, our bumblebees will be able to emerge earlier than honeybees mm -hmm. on a day because they're able, they're, they're warm blooded. They can warm themselves up. So you've got a sort of head here, mm -hmm. you've got a thorax where the wings are, and then you've got this big abdomen where it, it, it keeps all its um, nectar that it, and its eggs. And it's absolutely a flying miracle. I was going to say, because some of the ones that I've seen... Do it, you want to hold it? it? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> some of the ones that I've seen, I look at it and I go, I have no idea how you are actually flying yeah. for the size of it and then the size of the wings. Yeah. I mean, they are a miracle of nature, really, they aren't are. they? And in its chest area, in yeah. its thorax area, it's got a mass of muscles. Okay. And everybody thinks it's the wings that make that bzzz, that lovely droning yeah. sound of summer bzzz. But it isn't. It's the muscles vibrating. Okay. And that's... And it wow. Can, it can disconnect its wings from its muscles and it can buzz its muscles to warm itself up on cold days. Do you know what? You learn something new every day. Every and day's a school day. Yeah, and, and, and do you know, I'm fascinated about these bee facts. I had no I, I would have always have said that it would be the wings yeah, making the yeah. buzzing. And the wings, they can beat, wait for it, 200 beats a second. 200 beats a second? A second. How is that even possible? I don't know. Wow. But the more you find out about bumblebees, the f more you really understand what a precious creature they are yeah. uh, in mm -hmm. their own right. Yeah. They are a miracle of, of a species. And, you know, when I first started learning about them, because I trained as an ecologist, it was all about plants for me first, mm -hmm. the botany. Um, but plants and bees co-evolved together. Yeah. The one, the plant can't manage without the bee, it needs to be pollinated. Yeah. And the bee can't manage without the plants, it needs a nectar and pollen. So the symmetry mm. between the two is incredible. And of course, you know, having learnt about plants and then stumbled across the wonder of bumblebees, yeah. I'm completely hooked on them. Oh, no, I do, do you know what? I don't blame you. I'm totally hooked on them as well. So Himalayas, 450 million years yeah. ago. Uh, and then they gradually came down from the from the Himalayas as more plants arrived. They have to have plants. Yeah. Um, and so they've evolved as as they are today. And wasps have remained as as wasps. Wasps can be good pollinators, but wasps are really good carnivores. They clear up all the mess. Okay, so, so nature's like eating, clean up crew. Oh yeah, okay. they like eating dead flies and things like that. I think every. I don't think we should despise any insect really i think all insects you know are valuable um uh, and wasps are a, a little bit i would agree with you they're a little bit terrifying <laughs> i think it's only because i got stung seven no. times in one weekend <laughs> camping um and i don't know whether that was my fault for going camping but i was just yeah. yeah and and after that i was like oh just please tell me it's all for a reason yeah. and that they 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 do play a valuable role in good. the ecosystem service oh those stings are well worth yeah. it then and i'll tell you that we talked a little bit you asked about honeybees so honeybees different species and mm -hmm. um it was interesting, about three years ago, we did, we um, got some consultants to do some audience insights work for us. Yep. Um, and so they went out and they interviewed the general public or all over. And we got so much really good data about what people thought about bees. 54% mm -hmm. of adults didn't know the difference between honeybees and bumblebees. Okay. So that was the first thing. So that's another message I'm going to yeah, get across yeah, yeah. now. Grow more flowers yeah. and know the difference between honeybees and bumblebees. So bumblebees are wild bees. Mm -hmm. They look after themselves. We tend to talk about honeybees as domesticated or as livestock yep. because they are managed by a beekeeper. And so often, and I use this analogy all the time, so often we see save the bees and we see some hexagons. We see some hives, oh. or we see uh, honey yeah. all over the place. It's very much like me saying, I'm going to save the birds. I'm going to keep some chickens. Yeah, It's exactly the same. They're not in decline. They're not at risk of extinction. They are livestock. They perform a really good pollination role. I don't dislike honeybees at mm -hmm. all. They're valuable creatures, and they do perform a really good pollination role. But they are not need that we don't need to save them. 
Yep. We need to save the, the wild bees, which are our bumblebees. Yep. Okay, fascinating. So I think you touched on a point there, which I think is another myth around bees living in hives. So honeybees live in hives. They do indeed. But bumblebees? They live underground or they live in tussocky grass or they live in bird boxes. Love it. So, um, and I, I really hope that you can get on um, our social media channels because we launched a really brilliant animation only this week. You've got to go and see it. Okay. And it's all about bumblebees nesting. Okay. And it's been fantastically popular. It's all over Twitter. Mm-hmm. Uh, really great anima- animation, which uh, tries to encourage people to, to make space for bumblebees to nest. Mm-hmm. And as I say, this bumblebee, yep. the white tail, back over the white tail bumblebee, yeah. um, she tends to live in abandoned rodents' nests, okay. so underground. Yeah, um, and they like to have somewhere that's already preformed for them. Mm-hmm. Uh, something like a tree bumblebee, one of our species, as the name predicts, yep. it quite likes to live up high in trees or in bird boxes or under eaves. And then we have something called the common carder bee. Mm-hmm. And that likes to nest above ground, but in some wild, tusky, grassy areas. And um, in the old days, um, farmers who had sheep used to carder the wool of the sheep. Okay. And what the carder bee does is it carders the tusky grass into a nest. Ah, and that's why it's called, and that's how it's got the that's name. That's why it's called the carder bee. Yeah. Oh, fascinating. So we're talking about some of them like to nest underground. Um, what should people do if they find a nest at home? Because obviously we're talking about wasps stinging earlier. Yeah. From what I understand, like that's the, absolutely the last resort for a, a bumblebee to to sting somebody. So is, mm-hmm. if you find uh, is is that true? Yes, it's very true. They're quite benign mm-hmm. bumblebees. They're within forty minutes of starvation when they're on the wing. Oh wow! So they're really not interested in you. Yeah, they're only interested in getting to the next flower to feed up. Okay. And they're very, they're quite friendly. Yeah. Um, and yes, they do have a sting, but it's part of the egg laying mechanism. Uh, if you learn to identify bees and you can identify a male bumblebee, yep. you can handle those quite safely because they don't have a sting. Okay. So male bumblebees don't have a sting. No, they don't. Because they okay, don't lay eggs. It's, it's just for egg laying, yeah. essentially. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Fascinating. So, so um, if you find a bumblebee nest, just, you know, just watch it. Yeah. Just go keep a distance. And if you can video the comings and go, it's fascinating to watch. I've just got pictures workers. of you kind of laying there, Jill, on Absol- the grass, no, just true, watching them true. coming and going. It's when I walk down a I've got a little narrow road where I walk down to get onto the seawall. And if I walk down there and I see a bumblebee nest, yeah. I'm there on the road edge <laughs> looking like this, and people are walking past looking at me like that. It's What's the that same when I rescue is- <laughs> it's when I rescue bumblebees like your daughter. And yeah. You know, I've got a bit of card on the road to lift this poor bumblebee up, and people walk past it. What on earth is she doing? Yeah, but but yes. So, um, but Jill, I can quite imagine that you don't care what people think. I don't care. No, what people think. I love no. it absolutely. I just want to save our bumblebees. No, and and do you know what? I don't blame you. So, what is the typical lifespan of a bumblebee? Uh, it's not very long, so they have an annual life cycle. Uh, And so when this lovely big queen girl um, emerges from hibernation, she'll make a nest, uh, she'll make a big mound of pollen, and then she'll extrude some wax from her abdomen. Mm -hmm. And with her mandibles over here, she will fashion a lovely little wax cup about the size of a thimble. Okay. It's beautiful, like a little fairy cup. Yeah. And she'll put some nectar in there. And then when she lays her eggs... Uh, she'll have to brood them for four or five days and she will suck nectar to keep herself going and eat some of the pollen. And then when, uh, like most insects, it's eggs, larvae, pupa, baby bumblebees. Yeah. Baby bumblebees. Love it. Uh, and then the baby bumblebees, which are all the girls, they're all the workers. Yep. They'll go out, collect pollen, help the queen, keep the nest clean, brood the eggs and just generally do all the work. Okay, so fab. We've heard about all the women uh, bumblebees and all the work that they do. Give us a picture of a day in the life of a male bumblebee. Okay, so later on in the season, after the queen has laid all her workers yep. and they're working away, she'll lay some unfertilized eggs. Okay. And they will be the males. Mm-hmm. And the males will immediately leave the nest. And they'll do two things. They'll get drunk. 
and they'll have sex. Okay. Great. So that's it. That's all a male bumblebee does. Uh, I'm not going to mention any form of stereotype whatsoever. No, so it'll leave, they'll disperse <laughs> because they don't want to have sex with their sisters. That would be really wrong. Yeah. yeah okay, so bees, <laughs> be, bees are with that as well. Yeah. Great. And sometimes on a summer morning, you might find a bee splayed out on the head of a flower. Uh, it's probably a male because okay. it doesn't go Heavy home. night. It yeah. stays out all night. Uh, so they'll disperse. They'll find other nests to hang around in. Yep. Later on in the season, the queen, she yep. will lay more eggs and they'll be the new queens. And the new queens will emerge. The males will mate. And then everybody dies. Oh. The, or the old queen will die. The workers will die. The males will die. But the new queen that's just been mated, she'll go into hibernation. Okay, so it's, it's really six months for yeah. a queen, and the little workers can last between four and six weeks. So at that point, it's really you only live once. So you <laughs> need to crack on and live your life as a bee. Absolutely, you've got to live your best life yeah, as a bee. Absolutely, <laughs> I think the males do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, do you think bees have personalities? Oh gosh, I hope so. I hope so. Um, do bees have personalities? I think as a general species, they're a beautiful, serene, kindly bee. That's mm. what I'd like to see. They're, they're big and bumbling, you know. Yeah. They're, they're just benign is the word that yeah. I, I would use. They're so, so important. I don't want to underestimate their importance, mm -hmm. but they're just gentle creatures. And are they, are they sentient? Can they feel pain? Um, lots of research has been done mm -hmm. on, uh, a, and, and it has the brain the size of a grain of salt, this, this bee here. Okay, a grain of salt. Yeah, so that's the size of its brain. Wow, okay, uh, but, but they're not they, normally this big. They're not, <laughs> no, that, that, I, I would, think I would be a be bit worried. Yeah. <laughs> if I saw this coming at me in the garden, <laughs> I think... I think I'd duck or dive, <laughs> dive inside. Yeah. Um, there's been lots of experiments where they've trained bees to, to, to play football and put balls in hold and get honey and stuff. So there may well be. I don't think they'll ever be classified as a sentient yeah. being uh, because I don't know, to be honest, to that answer. I don't mm. know whether they feel pain or not. But they are quite clever. Hmm. Okay. So obviously we're... Animal friends, we have, all of our customers have cats, dogs, or horses. How can we be more knowledgeable about pets and bees? So, you know, can pets be allergic to bee stings? I know some humans are. Um, I think the answer to that is possibly, mm -hmm. yeah. I, I think, uh, you know, any sting of any, describe, of any description, whether it's from a bee or a wasp or an ant or a spider bite or something like that, yeah. will cause pain to any creature. And I think as pet owners, we will recognize that instantly because the, the, the pet will make it clear that they've been hurt. With bees, um, when you train dogs, you know, we all train our, our pets and our dogs mm -hmm. to be careful and, and say no. If they find a bee, it's just training it to say no, don't yeah. go near. I think that's the best and safest ways. You know, I have a cat that snaps. <laughs> snaps at things that fly past it. Yeah. I'm never going to train a cat no. to, to not catch a bee. No. You're just their servant. So yes, yeah, it's, yeah, that, it's, it's true, never going to be the other way around. No, it's not. <laughs> but with things like dogs, I think you can train them just to be careful. Interesting point. When um, Dave Goulson and uh, Ben Darvel were doing their research on bees, they trained a spaniel to sniff out bumblebee nests. Do you know what? That's really cool because their noses are amazing. Yeah. All dogs' noses are amazing, but some particularly more than others. And yeah. I know uh, spaniels are used in quite a lot of... Um, Drug-related. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Firearms, all sorts cats, of things. All of that kind of stuff. I don't think it was entirely successful, but I think they did have some limited success with 
uh, a dog because they needed to find out uh, about nesting in different areas. Mm -hmm. And the only way you're going to find out about populations of bumblebees is to find nests. Yeah. So they had this idea of training this dog up to. Oh, uh, that's amazing. Find. I love that dogs can help in bee conservation. Yeah. Isn't that marvellous? Yeah. That's a good link, that. So <laughs> if you if you found a, a nest in your garden, what are some of the practical things that you might be able to do to then help? So say I found one in my garden. How do I help keep Sky away from it? You know, would it be putting up a little fence? Yeah, or? you could do a little wire surround. Mm. Uh, bees navigate by uh, points in in the area so geographical points that will navigate them back to their their nest so if you are going to put something around their nest like something like chicken wire or something mm -hmm. see-through or be yeah. that prevents the dog getting at it um if it's underground um you know badgers are terrible predators of bumblebees okay we've always suggested putting a paving slab over the top so that the 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 badger can't and that might be something that you would consider doing as yeah, well. Yeah, because I just wouldn't want her to put her nose in. No, was, no. Because them flying around, I, I, I don't yeah. think she'd be too fussed by. But no. just, she's very inquisitive. So yeah. I just wouldn't want to yeah, put just, her nose in. Yeah, if you can just put a circle of, of some sort of wire around mm -hmm. just to be a, as a preventative measure for her getting too close. I think that would be the best thing. Yep, fabulous. One of the other key things that I wanted to, to talk to you about is what are the key things that people can really do from home? How do we how do we help create the right environment? So I know you were talking about bee friendly flowers, um, and we've lost a lot of our wildflowers. Is it really just about planting, or do they need space to be able to make nests? How how can people help from home? Well. This is a lovely intro. Thank you so much for this because we have the most amazing campaign going on. Okay. Called Be the Change. Love this. Okay. Yeah. So, Another again, it came out of the data from our um, audience insights mm -hmm. where uh, a lot of people said, Look, I'm really busy. I haven't got time to volunteer. You know, I'm more concerned about my mortgage, uh, my children's education you know, working, we, we just don't have time or money. Mm -hmm. So we constructed this campaign around simple micro actions that people can do that don't cost time and don't cost money. And it'd be simple as deadheading your flowers to make sure that they flower more often. Mm -hmm. Talking to your children, educating when you see a bee, yeah. say to your child, look how wonderful and, and learn about bees. Um, it's about thinking about what you can grow in your garden um, and when to, more importantly, when to plant it. Mm -hmm. Because there's lots of information about, uh, oh, you should be, you know, things, these things should be flowering. But there's very little information about when do I plant them in yep. order to make them flower. And Be The Change has got menus. It's got seasonal menus on there, which tells you when you should plant things and when they're going to flower. Um, it talks about seed collecting, mm -hmm. completely free opportunity to go down your country lane. And I collect seed from, I love cow parsley, yep. that lovely fluffy white stuff. Mm -hmm. I've got a shady area in my garden. Collecting seeds is so easy. Seed sharing. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't need to cost you anything. And there's some, I think there's some videos going around at the moment is when you buy tomatoes from the supermarket you can scrape the seeds out you can grow them the seeds from the tomatoes you buy from the supermarket so there's lots of different simple ways but i recommend people go on our be the change website yeah far as it's on our website and, and there's a million ideas but for me i'm going to use a phrase that um one of our colleagues told me when we were talking about our vision mm -hmm. and our strategy rodri said I want to put a bumblebee in everybody's heart. Oh, Isn't that, that, is, that is lovely. wonderful? Yeah. And that's what we want to do. So we really want to teach our children. It's the children, the next generation, that are so important to learn to love bumblebees. And if they learn to love bumblebees, they'll protect them. No, absolutely. So obviously teaching our, our future generations about how important it is, but... If you had one wish with the government today, <laughs> what would be the top one? Maybe <laughs> 500. I don't know, Jill. You tell me. What would be your top ask to really help for, for bumblebee conservation? 
I think it's, 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 a, it's a wider ask for me to put the environment at the top of the priority list. Mm -hmm. um, to ensure, you know, our, the, our environment for us humans, as we discussed earlier, underpins everything we do. We have got to get both the climate crisis and the biodiversity crisis, we have got to deal with it now. Mm -hmm. We've run out of time. And the only way we are going to deal with it, and I hesitate to say this because, but it is, is with more money. Mm -hmm. Money to educate people as to how to tackle it. Money to educate people as to how to create brilliant environments. Money just for people, you know, at charities who, who protect species to do their work mm -hmm. so that we have a thriving environment. Because without it, we're just not going to survive. Yeah. So, you know, we were talking about inspiring the next generation. Do you go out and work with different schools to then help educate, you know, the future of tomorrow about the importance? Oh, of we do. Days? We've got uh, a wonderful education officer, Andy, uh, he and he and I work hand in hand and we work with uh, hundreds of thousands of schools all over the place. And another tip, I think it's April the 18th, we are launching the Schools Be Accreditation Scheme. Oh, amazing. So schools yep. can get their bronze, silver and gold accreditation um, charts. Brilliant. Oh, that's lovely. Uh, and it's to get all the schools involved. So in how do they get that accreditation? Is it from looking at Habitat? Is it edu alongside education? Yeah, we, and... we provide all the resources mm -hmm. for them to achieve their, their bronze, silver and gold. Yep. Uh, and they're very simple things. It might be a simple thing as having an assembly about bumblebees. Amazing. Yeah, and so we've got a list of criteria, a tick list of the things that the school can do. Uh, it might be planting sunflowers or having a sunflower competition. Yeah. But something, again, we kept it simple, mm -hmm. kept it inexpensive because schools don't have money and something that the children can enjoy doing, getting their hands dirty yeah. outside. Yeah, because at my daughter's school, they have uh, a gardening area so that they... Um, either producing flowers or um, some vegetables and stuff like that so they can understand how things yeah. grow, but also then the importance of bees. Yeah, so well, sure they're well on their way to yeah, their exactly. gold, <laughs> gold award. Um, I'll mention yeah, that Yeah, keep an too. eye out for our bee accreditation scheme. Again, yeah. it'll be launched, it'll be on our website. So, uh, But very exciting because we do believe that education is the way forward for, for saving our bumblebees. Absolutely. So, Jill... I want to take some back some real geeky bee facts that people don't really know. What are your key ones that are like, oh, people just don't know this about bees. Okay. And that's why they're so amazing. Bumblebees have smelly feet. <laughs> <laughs> why, why do they have okay. smelly feet? Okay, so uh, when a bumblebee lands on a flower, yep. it leaves a little pheromone scent on the petal. Okay. It takes the pollen and takes the nectar. Yep. The next bumblebee that comes along knows that that flower is empty and because it can smell the scent on the petal and so it flies or it doesn't have to waste energy going landing there flies on to the next one okay that's a great way to communicate to go look mate i've already been here yeah you don't need to worry fly on to the next pub essentially yeah oh, absolutely fascinating. we've done the grain of salt of our 24 species yep lots of different tongue lengths some have a tongue that's two millimeters long yep and one has a tongue 19 millimetres long. 19 millimetres? 19 millimetres long. That's crazy. Why, why have they got the different uh, Well, tongues? they've evolved to pollinate different flowers. And some of our rarest bees are the ones with the longest tongues yeah. because our wildflowers that they rely on, like foxgloves, like comfrey, mm -hmm. are the ones where they're needed most. Because they need to get down. They need to get the, down, yeah. yeah. But our short tongue bees have been very cunning. Okay. Because they have learned how to nectar rob. Okay. Nectar rob. Okay. Yeah. Go on. So, so if you've got a comfrey flower, which is a tubular flower, yep. and you get your, your magnifying glass and you t look around the top edge of the flower, you'll see lots of little holes. So the bumblebee has poked its tongue through, drunk the nectar without pollinating the flower. Oh, that's cheeky. That's it is a very cheeky that, thing to that, do. Yeah, that is a cheeky thing to do. Very clever. So, obviously, this is a white-tailed bumblebee. They're not all black and yellow, right? No. The cardabee is orange. 
<laughs> I mean, yeah, okay. <laughs> and yeah. the uh, tree bumblebee is orange, black, and with a white tail. Yeah. And then my favourite, the bilberry bumblebee, has a very red, quite a lot of red on its abdomen, uh, but does have a, a black and yellow stripe on it. Yeah. So, yeah, and you've got a shrill carder bee there, which has got a little red bottom oh, yeah. and a, a yellow. It's more grey, the shrill yeah. carder bee. So lots of variations and lots of different colours. But mostly the ones that you see, the common ones, are the back and yellow stripe Yeah, ones. which everyone will associate yeah, bees absolutely. with. Absolutely, yeah. And are certain species of bee only in certain parts of the UK? Yes, that's true. So if we take the great yellow bumblebee, for example, that was widespread across the whole of the UK. Yep. But climate change and biodiversity lost has driven it further, further, further north. And now it's only found on Caithness and Sutherland, Orkneys, the Outer Hebrides. It's clinging on, on its geographical range, uh, on the Macca up there, which is a type of habitat that it thrives on. So, uh, yes, that's the Shaw Carder bee, our second rarest uh, English bee that has five populations down the south of England, uh, Somerset, Kent, Essex and over in South Wales. So, yeah, they Fab. have different distributions. And the bilberry bumblebee tends to live um, up on the moorlands like in the Peak District or in Wales. So, yeah, they have different geographical areas. So with that amount of geographical coverage... How do you really understand how many bees are in the UK and what they're doing and how they're doing it and how they're thriving or not? What, how, how do you manage all so of that? So the Bumblebee Conservation Trust is a science-based, mm -hmm. evidence-led charity. So we recognised when we first started that in order to answer that question, we needed data. Yep. And we had to work out how we were going to collect that data so in 2010, we launched Bee Walk. Now, Bee Walk methodology was where you set a one to two kilometer transect. Um, you walk it once a month during the flight season. Mm -hmm. You record the bees you see and the flowers that it's feeding on. And that's all very well. But first of all, you have to train people in order to identify bee. 24 species, how do they know when what bee? When most people only think there's one, one or two, yeah. Yeah. And they think it's a honeybee. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we had to train them. So we started off with about 35 volunteers. Mm -hmm. uh, and we started off BID training and got them set up. We now have over 750 Bee Walkers How spread amazing. across the UK. We have a whole series of webinars and events to keep training people on bee identification. We are the only organization in the world that holds the data for bumblebee populations in the UK. And uh, it's uh, every year our wonderful science manager, Richard Comont, spends months analyzing the data, putting it together in what we call the Bee Walk Report, mm -hmm. which is again found on our website. And that tells you or answers the question that everybody asks me, how are the bees doing, Jill? <laughs> <laughs> and I refer them to the Bee Walk Report. <laughs> so are there any, if there's any listeners on here from a specific area, are there any areas that you struggle to uh, fill the Bee Walk Report because you don't have enough people in that area? Yes, Scotland. Scotland. So all uh, of our Scottish listeners, uh, please. The North East. Yeah. Okay. Teesside, yeah. Nor North York's Moors, uh, Northumberland. And uh, these are the lesser populated areas, of course. Yeah. And Wales, North Wales within, uh, although we're getting better in North Wales, we've had a Skills for Bees project there. But those are the areas. But I'd also encourage people who live in the Somerset area mm -hmm. or in the South Wales area to learn about specifically about the shrill carder bee. Yeah. Because if we can get them identifying the shrill carder bee, that gives us great hope to, yeah. to save this bee. Oh, that's, yeah, fantastic. And uh, are there any other ways um, that people inspired by our conversation today can really help the Bumblebee Conservation Trust moving forward? What are the, some of the key things that they can do to help? I, I know it's going to sound obvious, but you could join as a member. Mm -hmm. It's £25 a year. What's that? A cup of coffee a month. Yep. But that unrestricted income, as we call it, from membership allows us to really get to grips with putting more habitat down and our conservation officers can go out and work with farmers and landowners to really encourage people to put more flowers down. Mm -hmm. So join in the trust. Um, just looking at our, going on our website 
and using the tools and learning about it. If you're a teacher, we've got loads of free curriculum resources, all free, you can just download. Because if teachers start using that literature mm. for their children, that's going to be a big plus for us as well. Absolutely. So look at the website. You've got tons of resources on there. You can join as a member. Um, and I suppose just share the interesting facts that you've heard today absolutely. about the wonderful life of bumblebees. Yeah. yeah, it's been absolutely brilliant. I could talk about bees for hours. Yeah, no, I, and honestly, I would just continue to ask a million questions, <laughs> but I, I do realise other people do have lives. Um, so it's been so wonderful to talk to you today, Jill. Thank you so much for, for coming in and talking to us oh, and sharing your passion for bees. I yeah. mean, one of our values is is being passionate about what you do and you ooze that in, well, in so much. What's not to love? I know. <laughs> yeah, one, please tell me you've got like 23 other ones to... to sit alongside this one when you're educating people uh, no i haven't i have got oh. i have got some more of these uh they got the but no not not very many but we're hoping to create some more for sale at some point oh. but they're beautiful aren't they they are very much so thank you so much again jill it's yeah, been an absolute pleasure and i'll speak to you soon okay thanks thanks <laughs>